In Mark chapter 4, verse 35, if you're, if you're there and able to stand, I invite you to do so as we honor the Lord in the reading of his word. We'll start here in 35 and read through to the end of the chapter. On that day, when evening had come, he, Jesus, said to them, his disciples, let us go across to the other side and leave in the crowd. They took with him in the boat. They took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we're so thankful, so thankful for, for your ministry among us, Lord. We're thankful for your word. And Lord, we're thankful for what you do through your word. Lord, I confess that I am, uh, I need you, God. I need you to rightly expound the scriptures and to uh, proclaim them with clarity. Lord, I plead your grace for your grace. And Lord, I plead not only for myself, but for the hearers of the word. Lord, that you would prepare the soil of the hearts on which this seed will fall. Lord, I pray that as, as your word goes forth, Lord, that it would accomplish the purpose that you've given to it. And Lord, I know that it will because you've already promised that it would. Lord, soften, soften our hearts that we may be receptive and ready to hear. God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. God, let us not leave this encounter with your word unchanged. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we wrap up chapter four, so chapter four was, was a chapter full of parables, and then now we come to the end. Chapter four has four parables that concludes with the first of four miracles that Jesus then uses to authenticate his message. He's given this teaching through the parables, and now he's about to perform Four miracles that will, in this, will, will support and authenticate his message. See, he performs a, a supernatural act, a miracle. And this adds even greater credibility to his teaching. And after seeing this miracle, the disciples, as well as you and I today, are challenged to take the person of Jesus Christ and his teaching very, very seriously. Chapter 4, as you may remember, began with Jesus. He's, he's teaching to the multitudes. There's a, a large crowd there. It's so large that he had to, to get off of the land, get out on a boat where he might step off to the side, step out into the boat, boats out in the water, and then address the crowd in that way. And here, well, let's just paint the picture of what's going on. Jesus has been preaching and teaching all day long. The, the impression we get from Mark 4 is that all of this occurs in the same day. And then, and then based on what we know about fishing boats in this day, Jesus is, is out on a boat that's some 27 feet long and 7 to 8 foot wide and about 4 or 5 feet deep. So you can kind of get a picture of what kind of boat Jesus is out there fishing in. And, and this boat sits in the Sea of Galilee. If you're familiar with your geography, the Sea of Galilee sits in the northern portion, and then the River Jordan makes its way down to the Dead Sea. 
And all of this is, is very low. The Sea of Galilee sits 700 feet below sea level, surrounded by mountains and hills on the sides. In fact, 30 miles to the north, there is Mount Hermon, which is, is over 9,000 feet above sea level. So you've got the mountain here, and then about 10,000 feet below that, you've got the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is, is a large sea. Sometimes it's referred to as the Lake of Gennesaret, but it's, it's not like a, a lake like we might think of. It's, it's very large. It's 12 miles long and about 8 miles wide. And this is the sea in which Jesus is sitting in the boat teaching the crowd. Well, the Sea of Galilee is known for some dangerous storms that pop up from time to time. It's a and it's not like a pop-up shower like we think of today. It gets really hot and, and it's going to rain on us. Well, there, it's a severe storm. There's wind, rain, lightning. And, and at the end of this day, this day in which Jesus has been teaching and preaching, he's been explain, expounding these parables that we read of in chapter 4, Jesus suggests, let's go to the other side of the sea. And this, this would make sense. You know, to you and I, we might think, well, why doesn't he do it during the daytime instead of at night? Well, oftentimes the, the storms would come up during the day and not at night. Fishermen would, known, would be known to go out at night instead of during the day. And so they, they were going to cross the sea that night. And as they go, a great storm blows up. This is a familiar text to many. A great storm blows up and it's beaten against the boat. So much so is the wind and the rain that the waters are filling the boat up. And these men, these experienced fishermen, are out there at the sea at night fearing for their lives. And come to find out, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of this storm that has these fishermen fearing for their lives, where is Jesus? Now, he's asleep at the back of the boat. Now, the disciples, as we read, they, they appear to be a little irritated with Jesus. Don't you care that we're about to die, basically, they say to Jesus. And Jesus woke up, and he rebukes the wind and the, the sea. He says, peace, be still. And it happened. The wind stopped. The sails that have been blowing like crazy and are all shredded up because of the storm, they just drop. The water which has been blowing into the boat, is now just like glass. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he asks two questions. First is this, why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? And then the second, probably the most cutting of the questions is this, how is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? Well, verse 41 records that they responded with even greater fear after all this had happened. Interesting, isn't it? It was not the storm that caused the greatest fear, but the calming of the storm that provided such uh, fear to them. Well, as we make our way through this passage, as I was reading, you may have noticed a word that kept coming up. And that word that just kept coming up in the text is great. Great. Three times the scriptures mention great, that there is a great storm. And then next we see after the great storm that came upon them, suddenly there is a great calm after Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. And the third great is used to describe the fear that filled the disciples after Jesus calmed it all. Well, these three greats are going to form the, the outline for our, our sermon this morning. These greats. And we're going to start with the first great, and it is that great storm. And so this trip began as a normal trip across the Sea of Galilee. There are several of the, several of the disciples, are, they're experienced fishermen. And so they're familiar with the weather and the patterns and all the things like that. And, and as Jesus says, let's go to the other side, they, they don't express any opposition. They don't say, you know, it looks like a storm's brewing. This might not be a good idea. They're, they're ready to go. They see no reason for concern. Maybe they knew the, the saying, pink in the morning, sailors tank, take warning, but pink at night, sailors delight. Maybe it was pink that night. I don't know. Maybe they didn't even know the saying. We kind of use that one around our house a little bit. But, but whether they did or not, it seemed like everything looked good. And so when Jesus said, 
Let's go to the other side. As he did in verse 35, they went. Now, there's something that I want you to notice here. The disciples are headed out into this storm. And what, what is it that leads them out into this storm? Well, it's not the carelessness of the disciples. It's not the recklessness of their decision-making that led them into the storm. What's leading them into the storm is their obedience to Jesus. Do you notice that? Jesus is the one who is leading them across the sea. It's his idea that they would go out there that night. He is the one that led them out across the sea and into the storm. The storm is no surprise to Jesus. You know, there's application for us in this. Sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of a difficult situation because of our own doing, because of our own sinfulness, because of our own rebellion, because of our own foolishness. But sometimes, however, we find ourselves in the midst of a difficult situation because we've been obedient to the Lord. Because God has led us there. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we will experience difficulties in our faithfulness, in our obedience to Christ. When we live according to the way God has called us to live, sometimes it makes things harder, not easier. As we look through scriptures, we see multiple illustrations of this. Think of Job, for example. Was Job doing, when, doing anything wrong when all of these things came crashing down? No. Now, Satan said... Uh, well, well, God says, have, have you considered my servant Job? And, and then Satan brings all these things against him. He takes away his children, destroys all of his land, all of his property. Everything but his wife is taken away from him. His health deteriorates. And his friends, or so-called friends, they, they accuse him and they call on him to repent and say things will get better. But he hadn't done anything wrong in the first place so much. But his response to the Lord is not without sin. And he, but he does know this. He knows that all trouble is not brought on by the sin in our lives. You see, sometimes God brings on a situation that is not so good for our good, for our growth, and for his glory. On Wednesday nights, we've been making our way through Genesis, right? And the man that we talked about this last Wednesday night was a man, Joseph. My wife and I were talking after, after Bible study that night about how there are not very many men and women in Scripture that God uses so greatly that he, he doesn't say anything bad about the Scriptures don't reveal the sinfulness of their life. Like, like David had an affair, was a murderer. We could go on. But, but Joseph, Joseph experiences all kinds of terrible things in his life. He is sold into slavery. He, he is serving underneath a man whose wife wants to have an affair with him. And when he refuses, when he does the right thing, a bad thing happens to him and he's put in the dungeon. But as we see kind of at the end of the story, as I often say, as Paul Harvey says, now that when we know the rest of the story, in Genesis 45, three times it states that as, as Joseph is speaking to his brothers, he's saying, it's not so much you who did this to me, but God sent this upon me. God was the one who did it. He was working out all of this evil for my good. You know, sometimes we hear a false gospel. A false gospel that Jesus is kind of the life fixer. That's what he does. You come to Jesus and he fixes all your problems. If you've got money problems, come to Jesus. He'll fix your problems. If you've got health troubles, come to Jesus. He'll fix all your problems. But as we look through the scriptures, we don't see that that's the case, do we? Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that, that Jesus doesn't help us through our struggles and, and sometimes alleviate some of our, our struggles, but but usually he doesn't eliminate our problems altogether, does he? God doesn't promise to, to keep us from storms, but he promises to be with, their, be with us through those storms. And the fact of the matter is, as we see in the lives of these men and in this situation in particular with, with Jesus and his disciples, sometimes obedience to Jesus brings on more trouble. 
and the disciples. We see that he did not solve all of their problem. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't protect them from all kinds of harm. In fact, most of them were martyred. They were killed for their faith. Sometimes he led them into problems. And Peter, that's why Peter says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. You see, the Christian life is full of trials. We ought to expect difficulties at times in the Christian life. Jesus himself endured suffering and trials. And so we should expect the same. And in our storms, in our trials, in our sufferings, we often will question like the disciples did. Do you notice the question that they ask of Jesus when he was asleep? They said, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care? Sometimes we cry out the same thing when we're going through a hard time. God, don't you, don't you care? You're the sovereign God of the universe. You control all things. You could do something about this. You could end this right now. And we doubt the love of God, and we doubt the goodness of God, and the wisdom of God, and we doubt the sovereignty of God. But in all of this, does God care? Yes, brothers and sisters. Yes, God cares. That was the whole reason that Jesus was with them in the first place. If we're going to go back to the disciples here. The whole reason that Jesus was with them in the first place, the whole reason he was on the earth is because he cared. Interestingly, they ask him, do you not care that we are perishing? Perishing? Remember that verse that we read just a few moments ago together, John, John 3, 16, one of the most well-known verses in all of Scripture says that God in love sent his son Jesus into the world so that what? So that we wouldn't perish. So that we would have everlasting life. This is the God who cares, brothers and sisters. And he went to great lengths to save his people. In your storm, don't doubt God's love for you. He has already shown it in the most marvelous terrifying of ways and laying down his life on the cross for those who believe in him. Jesus' question, how is it that you have no faith, reveals something else about the disciples, reveals that they were lacking some trust, doesn't it? They, weren't, they didn't place their faith in him. Now, they had already seen and heard enough from Jesus to know that, that he could protect them. He's the one who said, let's go to the other side. They ought to have assurance that when Jesus says, let's go, that you're going to get there. But they were listening to the voice of the storm, the waves and the wind, instead of the truths of Jesus and the voice of the Lord. Storms will test our faith. Storms will test our faith. But they will also provide an opportunity for us to lean in and trust in God in ways that we would never have known before. It's an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. As I've heard it said before, a, taste, a, a faith that has not been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. But as we get past the great storm, the second great that we see is the great calm. Now, throughout the Gospel of Mark, we have seen over and over again the clear teaching of Jesus' authority the clear example of Jesus' authority. We've seen his authority in casting out demons. We've seen his authority in healing the sick. We've seen his authority in forgiving sins. Got him in a lot of trouble with the Pharisees when he said that. But we've seen his authority there, and we've seen his authority in his teaching. He teaches as one with authority. And in this passage, we see Jesus' authority over nature. See, he brings great calm to this great storm. Jesus, after being woke up, he, he rebukes the storm in much the same way he rebuked the demon. He said, peace, be still. Imagine yourself out on the boat that night with, with Jesus and the disciples. It's, you're out on the sea. There's no light pollution back at 30 AD. It's dark. And as the storm is, is making its way across the sea, as it's wreaking its havoc against the boat, there's no light. The only light you would see is from the, the momentary flash of lightning. 
The waves are crashing over the side of the boat. You can feel the water coming up your ankles. The boat is filling up with water. And these experienced fishermen are fearing for their lives. And then what happens? But Jesus speaks. Jesus spoke. And immediately, instantaneously, peace be still, boom. Peace and stillness. This is the power and authority of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. This is the power of Jesus. He has supernatural powers. He is beyond the powers of the natural world. His, he's beyond explanation of science. Science can't put their finger on what Jesus is and does, brothers and sisters. You can't explain it. This is the same Jesus, remember, that we pray to. This is the same Jesus who intercedes for us, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. Does this change the way you pray? Jesus Jesus has the power to calm the sea in an instant. Jesus has authority over everything. It ought to bolster our faith whenever we pray. It ought to bolster our confidence as we cry out to the Lord. Just as God produced order from chaos in the beginning through His spoken word at creation, creation now immediately responds to the spoken word of Jesus as He says, peace be still. Now, when you and I experience the storms of life, remember this. God is the grantor of peace. God is the grantor of peace. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, submit your request to God. Let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This, this great calm can only be the work of a great God. In this, we're not simply intended to see that, that Jesus has power over nature, just as he had power over illness and power over demons. Its ultimate purpose, purpose is to show us that Jesus can do what only God can do. Jesus is God. He is the God-man. He's not just a good man or a good teacher or a prophet, but Jesus is God in the flesh, fully God, fully man, truly God, every bit God and every bit man walking among them. And this God is in the boat with the disciples in that storm. The disciples didn't fully understand all of this. But they had seen the power of God on display. And in response to seeing this power, what the result is, is great fear. It's our third great in this passage. Verse 41 says, And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, they didn't understand quite who Jesus was yet. But they knew there was something special going on in what was going on in the boat that night. See, back in verse 40, Jesus asked them, why are you so afraid? Now in verse 41, he speaks of an even greater fear. See, there was storm, there was fear in the midst of the storm, but the fear that they have now, the fear now that Jesus has calmed the storm, and now that they, they see what kind of power resides in Jesus, there's even greater fear. Greater fear. What we see is that more terrifying than a storm outside of the boat is a holy God in the boat. Jesus is still a stranger to his followers for they're better, better able to uh, handle the possibility of their own death and the possibility of, of the presence of God among them. At this point in their lives, God's nearness in Jesus is not something reassuring to them. And in fact, it's something terrifying. Upon seeing the result of Jesus' words, upon seeing the wind cease and the perfect calm of the sea that came upon the, the storm, the disciples are filled with, with wonder and with reverence and fear and awe at the supernatural power and authority of this Jesus. This is our Jesus. 
the one who did what we just read about. Don't let these stories that have become familiar to us grow old and lose their power. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has power over all things. Upon seeing this power, though they didn't know who he was, they knew that this was something they had never seen and never heard of before. All this reminds me of Peter. Peter in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. See, it says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, it's very similar to our passage here in Mark, they're pressing in to hear the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught from the boat, as he did at the beginning of Mark chapter 4. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let your nets in for a catch. Let them down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were, were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both boats so that the boats began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, and he said this. This is what we've been building to right here. G Peter says to Jesus, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. Did you hear that? Peter said, depart from me. I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. Why would one have a reaction like this to Jesus? What's the reaction of one who knows this Jesus is no ordinary man? This, this Jesus is God himself. And in recognition of this, he falls on his knees before him. The Israelites, likewise, had a similar encounter back in Exodus 14 when, they were to, when God was working to move them out of Egypt, displaying his power in the plagues. It says that the Israelites feared the Lord and put their trust in him. That should be the process, brothers and sisters. Fear and then trust. The question before the disciples and before us today and all who would ever read this gospel is this. Will you put your faith in him? Will you put your faith in him? Will those of you who have never repented of your sin trust Jesus Christ for salvation? Will you see yourself as you are rightly, as God sees you? Will you see yourself as Peter saw himself at the day of that miraculous catch? Will you see yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior? Will you acknowledge your sin before the holy creator of the universe? As we've mentioned already a couple of times, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe would not have to perish but could have everlasting life. Brothers and sisters, outside of Christ, you are on the path to perishing like the rest of the world. But you don't have to be. Jesus has made a way. He is the way. You too can be forgiven of your sins and have everlasting life because of Jesus' perfect life. His substitutionary death and His glorious resurrection. Because of what Christ has done, we can be Saved. Jesus said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And for you who are in Christ, but yet continue to live in fear, I want to remind you that trusting in Jesus is not a one-time thing, brothers and sisters. Trusting Jesus is a day after day, hour by hour, moment by moment activity in the life of a follower of Jesus. We trust Jesus and then we trust Jesus. And then we trust Jesus again. Will you put your trust in him moment by moment? Not leaning on your own strength and your own power, but leaning on him. Is Jesus saying to you who are fearful in your fear and anxiety, 
Is he saying to you, why, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Do you not know who I am? Brothers and sisters, when fear and doubt assail us, we must rest in what we know about Jesus. There are, there's lots of stuff flying at us from the world, from our television sets, and everything else. We must rest in what we know to be true. Remind yourself of who Jesus is. Remind yourself of what he has done. Remind yourself of his love, this love that never ends. Remind yourself of the wisdom of God. There is no weakness in the wisdom of God. Remind yourself of the sovereign hand of God and the goodness of God. We hang on to these things when the lies come in, when doubts come in, when fear comes at us. Brothers and sisters, if you find yourself in a storm right now, rest in this. Jesus knows where you are. Your storm is no surprise to him. He, he puts you there. He's with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And rest in this. As we've been reminded in, in the stories of Job and of Joseph, God is not going to waste your storm. He's going to use it for your good. He's going to use it for his glory. And that's what he aims to accomplish in, in your storm. Your sanctification, your, your growing in Christ, increasing your faith. And so lean on him. Trust in him who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Lean into Christ today if you find yourself in a storm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm reminded of this, the song we sang before we started. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's hope for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Heavenly Father, help us to grow in the trials that come our way. Help us to lean ever more on you, Lord. Lord, when storms come, remind us that you are the God of the storm. You don't run away from the storm. You have the power to calm it. But through it all, you'll definitely be with us. Heavenly Father, if there are any here today who don't know you, I pray that they would trust you today. Father, if there be any here who are walking through a storm and, and need prayer and strength, to persevere through the storm. Lord, I pray that they would come and we pray together. They would seek comfort in the family of God here. Lord, for those who have been trying to do it on their own, Lord, remind them that, that your grace is enough. Your grace. You will give us the strength. We must lean on you and seek you. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song of response. I invite you to stand if you're able. And if the Lord is leading you to respond by coming forward today, I encourage you to do so.
Amen. Well, it's been good to be together to worship today. It's good to see this place filled up a little bit more than it was last month with our two services. It's, it's always good to be together. And uh, I want to remind you, um, first of all, we, we are, are not taking up a regular offering as we, as we have passing the plate, but the plates are at the, the back of the, of the sanctuary here and encourage you to, to give that there as you go out. We're working on uh, getting the Lord's Supper taken. Here in the next few weeks, we've ordered some packets that have everything all in one, so we're not having to pass the plate there, too. And so hopefully by the end of the month, we'll be able to do that. Everybody's trying to do the same thing, so it's on back order. But, but we'll get that done, Lord willing. And, uh, and just a reminder, we've got the, the two brief meetings here after the service. We'll just meet up here at the front, meet with Sunday school teachers and, uh, and children's ministry uh, team there too. But let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Charlie, would you want to come? I've got, got a microphone here so everybody can hear you. Would you dismiss us in prayer? Hasn't it been great to be in God's house this morning? Boy, you look back, a lot of people back here. The Andersons used to be members, moved away, but they always keep coming back. That's great. Welcome to, to them. Yeah. So uh, it's been great. But, you know, since March, our church has been through quite a storm. And uh, God has blessed us through all this. Uh, we just look around. We see way, the ways that we have been blessed. But, you know, God did use several individuals through this to really guide us through this storm. Pastor Matt has done a lot of work, a lot of behind-the-scenes things that we're not even aware of. So we thank you for your leadership. And then as we begin to come back and meet, you know, two services, Dee and Vicki and Wanda put in a lot of extra hours. And there's a guy back here in the corner that always sits way back there that has put a lot of work in, taking care of keeping things clean and sanitized for us. Terry has done a lot of behind the scene work. So. If you haven't thanked these individuals, be sure that you do, because God has used them in a mighty way through this storm and continues to use them. So we're very blessed. So uh, again, uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, as we come to you again, we just thank you for your love, that you're always there for us. And we go through many storms in our life. And unfortunately, many times in these storms is when we kind of turn away. But you're always there. You always welcome us back with open arms. And we're, we're so thankful for your love and what you do in our lives. And help us to always be faithful to you. Again, we just thank you for the many, many blessings that you not only blessed us with here at church, but in our homes and our families. We have so much to be thankful for, but most of all, we thank you that you gave of your son 
to die for our sins that we might have everlasting life. We continue to lift our church up to you that you would be with us. We're excited about your future and as we're coming through this storm and, and uh, we, we're just excited about how things are you're working in our church. And we want to remember each of our homes that are represented this morning. We thank you for them and then we have church family that uh, would love to be here, but due to illness and other problems, just can't be here. And we, we lift them up to you in a very special way that you be with them and be with our church family, many are traveling and, and vacations and things of this nature. We lift them up, pray for their safety. But again, we just thank you for your love. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.